tell you a little bit about his background first. Alfie uh, has two, he spent a lot of time at Cambridge, Mass. He's got two degrees, uh, one in mathematics from Harvard, uh, not to mention one in architecture from MIT. So split loyalties there, right? <laughs> so he's, uh, but he's been on the island for many, many years. And uh, when he first came, he started the Sanford Boat Company with his brother Edmund. Uh, also started a boat company out in uh, San Francisco Bay, uh, the Sanford uh, Wooden Marine. And uh, but what Alfie is here to talk about today is the love of, love of boats that he's had lifelong. Uh, at Sanford, at Sanford uh, Boat Company, he and Edward made uh, Hilarion class, and they grace our harbor every summer. As you've seen, it's one of the most lovely sights coming into the harbor to see the products of, um, of Alfie's work. Even many years before that, though, Alfie had a, a real attraction to a particular boat called Impala, which you probably have seen out there, too. Some of you may have had the pleasure of being on it. Uh, that, he bought that in 1986, and he sailed that 75,000 miles since. Am I right on that? 75,000 miles since. And so what Alfie's here to talk with us about today is, is an adventure in particular this past in 2011, sailing across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, I'm going to introduce Alfie right after I ask everybody, as I am bound to do, right, Lindsay? Mm -hmm. Please turn off your cell phones, okay? And uh, enjoy. Alfie, welcome. Thank you, Bill. And uh, it's nice to be here. So today I'm going to tell you a story and show you some pictures of a trip that uh, I took with four uh, I consider them youngsters from Nantucket. Uh, the wonderful thing about Nantucket is it's got this fabulous harbor, and the harbor is connected by the ocean to the whole world. And so we're going to, in this case, to Gib Gibraltar. We're going to Europe, to the old world, and uh, it all starts in the boat basin. We're going to get the groceries aboard and get ready. Now, this winter, I'm talking about 19, uh, 2011, uh, Connor Wallace and I have sailed the boat over to Falmouth and had it hauled out for insurance inspection. We've gotten the life raft inspected. Uh, that sort of backup stuff you don't see, but what people are really interested in now is getting enough food aboard and the right kinds and good food and stuff like that. And we take the boat over to the fuel dock uh, for the, um, to fill up the tank. And a lot of well-wishers are there. It's a cold day. Uh, March, it's May 12th now. Uh, we're running late. Uh, we wanted to get off on the 1st, so we're almost two weeks late. And uh, it's been blowing out of the northeast for five days now. Uh, there's the crew all lined up for the last pictures. Uh, I'll introduce them later, but uh, these are fellows from Nantucket. Everybody's been aboard Impala before, and I'm the old man. I've got four really young, strong guys, so I don't have to do any work at all, so it's really a good deal for me. And so there we go. Uh, this is a wonderful picture taken by Jim Power at the Inquirer and Mary. He actually took this from the Jetty's beach. Uh, and as you can see, it's rough. And it, it raises the question, why are we going today? <laughs> I mean, why not go tomorrow? And uh, well, it happens that today is Thursday, May 12th. So tomorrow is Friday the 13th. And you say, well, really, what difference does that make? And so I'll just tell you a story. This is the Peking, probably the, one of the strongest ships ever built, steel German boat. Uh, we've got Irving Johnson aboard. That's why this story is uh, recorded. And she's leaving Hamburg for Western Australia, about a 20,000-mile trip. And for some reason, she leaves on Friday. And I think I've got everything. And the captain, you know, who knows a little something about these things, decided that, see, there's Hamburg. So 
Friday afternoon, Friday evening, he anchors in the mouth of the river, figuring that, well, maybe Neptune won't figure this one out. He'll actually be leaving on Saturday. So Saturday dawns, there's not much wind, and so time is money with these folks. So he gets a tow from a steam tugboat, and they tow out toward, they get about halfway down the North Sea to off Holland, and they've got a light easterly breeze. Well, money is money, too. So he drops the tow at that point and figures they can get underway. And right about then, you can see the red line sort of indicates their track. A uh, gale springs up out of the southwest. And of course, this is a very powerful ship. It doesn't go to windward very well. And so they spend the next eight days beating from here down to the Straits of Dover, which is about, I don't know, 100 miles away. They're making about 12 miles a day. And they get into the Straits of Dover, and you know it's very constricted. It's like sailing out Great Round Shoal Channel. Plus, it's full of traffic, wind flying even harder out of the southwest. They finally have to turn around and sail back into the North Sea and try it again. Well, Anyway, after 10 days of this, there they are. They're actually 10 miles behind where they dropped the tugboat. <laughs> but they're still trying. These guys are tough guys, and they don't give up easy. So they sail a little bit further, and a couple days later, they're, you know, they're, they're back up about here, and they get a hurricane-force winds come up out of the northwest and start to press this boat down. She can't make way against it. And they start pushing her back into the coast. And the sun comes up that morning. Now it's Friday the 13th, two weeks after they've left Hamburg. And this is a shallow coast. This is a big ship, as you can see. And they really figure that they've lost the boat. I mean, they're getting ready to get in the lifeboats and stuff like that. It's just a matter of another hour or two, the boat will run aground, lose control. The waves will take over. Well, they get a slight shift of wind and are able to turn the boat around and sail off the lee shore. It takes three miles to turn this boat around, and they probably had four miles of space. I mean, it was that close. And I guess Neptune at that point forgave the captain for trying to fool him with the anchoring process. And they sailed it in two more days. They were down through the Straits of Gibraltar and out. But it took 16 days to go the first 200 miles of this 20,000-mile trip. And so and that's one reason not to leave on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, off we go. And we headed out. The wind was strong northerly. Uh, we had to beat out to Tuckernuck Bell. In the process, we uh, got our man overboard drilled. And uh, I showed the boys how to heave the boat to, which they weren't all familiar with. And uh, once we get to Tuckernuck Bell here, we start to head off, and things get a little better. We come out here off Cape Pogue and make a turn down the Cape Pogue Channel. And you can see the uh, land in the background there. I don't know if it shows, but right about there is Cape Pogue Light. And we're headed south out Muskegon Channel. Uh, the wind's blowing about 30 plus, but now it's behind us, so things are much easier. People are starting to smile a little bit. I'm properly dressed, though, you can see. And there we go. Now, what's happening here is uh, you can see us come out between Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, and we're running before this northwesterly gale, which is dying down a little bit. And right there is midnight, so we're 12 hours from Nantucket, and the first purple line, I've marked the water temperatures, that's 47 degree water temperature, I mean it's cold. But the second purple line is 71 degrees. So that's where we enter, it was actually a meander of the Gulf Stream. But believe me, it really makes a big difference. <laughs> and I w actually, I want to go back to that as well. Yeah. Uh, 
we kept running now. The problem now is, is it's time to turn and go east to Europe, but we've got northeasterly wind, so we're pretty much hard on the wind here. You can see us gradually make our turn. Uh, and all day Friday, we're sailing in warm water, but still overcast, rain, not very nice weather. And Saturday morning, we get a break in the clouds. And things start to look a little better. Now you can see here we're becalmed. So this is just, uh, well, 40 hours out of Nantucket. It's now, it's warm, uh, the wind has gone down. And one thing that's interesting, you'll notice that uh, what wind there is, we're still more or less close hauled. Now the idea here is you sail south of Nantucket and you get in the ocean and you're in the westerlies. Uh, so it's going to be a run all the way to Gibraltar, right? It turned out we, we never had the wind aft of a beam for the 26 days. That's just the way it is. <laughs> but some of the clothes are coming off. And the next, later that afternoon, we're having lunch there. It's tropical. And things are starting to dry out a little bit. I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, the, the boat is organized. There were five of us, and me being the old man and the captain and the owner, I didn't stand watch. So, <laughs> so I'd be up or down whenever I wished. And the other four I split into two groups. It takes two people to sail the boat, one, one to steer it, one to handle the sails or whatever. So we were, we, and these guys all knew what they were doing, so we were well crewed, which allows me when I'm off watch to sleep well. And then they're ready to have summertime. It's, it's still, now it's May 14th. It's, you know, it's like the whole climate has changed or the whole season has changed. That's what the Impala looks like. We're, we're 500 miles from Nantucket now. The water's two and a half miles deep, so you don't have to worry about bumping your head. There's uh, Connor Wallace out there with a waterproof camera. So I'll introduce the crew. Uh, this is Russell Bartlett. He's just graduated from uh, Emerson College where he studied filmmaking. Uh, he had a dream in January of this month, this is going back to 2011, that very soon he was going to sail across the Atlantic. So when I called him up two months later in March, he was ready. He knew what he wanted to say. <laughs> you know, you, I don't know how you explain things like that. There's Cotter. He's in the process of taking some of the pictures. See, he's been sailing on Impala for about 11 years. He's been across the Atlantic the other way with us once before, so this is gonna complete his circle of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, Connor's now in San Francisco, is captain of the Santana, which is Humphrey Bogart called schooner, which is about the size of Impala. And he, rumor has it that he may be here with her this summer in Nantucket, which will be fun. That's Oliver Lafarge. He's a citizen of Tuckernock. He shows up in Nantucket every now and then. And uh, he's been sailing on Impala almost as long as uh, Connor, but this is his first uh, transatlantic. And this is Bill Frederick. And he's uh, newer to Nantucket, he didn't wasn't born here, but he's been around for about 15 years. He's a uh, fanatic sailor, small boat sailor, and some of you all may know him as a diesel mechanic. And in the wintertime, he lives in Montana and runs snow cats. And uh, he's also a tree man, a big tree man. He can climb up the top of Douglas fir tree and measure it for logging, that kind of thing. He's a very interesting guy. 
And he'd been on Impala before, but this is really his first big offshore trip. And that's me. And then I'll introduce the Impala. Uh, she's been here, as Bill said, she's been here in Nantucket for almost 30 years now. She actually, I first saw her in 1954 from Brant, 1955 from Brant Point when she was brand new and she sailed into Nantucket. And she used to live in Egertown, and she'd come over here two or three times a summer, all through the uh, 50s and 60s. And uh, then she uh, went away, the, the original owner sold her, uh, actually to Bob Larson, who's a Nantucketer, but he didn't keep her here. He had her for a short while, and then she had an interesting history in the drug trade in the Caribbean, ended up in jail, uh, and got auctioned off and went to San Francisco, to California, where I found her, and brought her back in 1986. Uh, and she's a really lovely, old-fashioned gentleman's cruising yacht. She was built as an ocean racer for New Yorkers. I mean, she's, she was considered a gold plater at the time. Uh, but she doesn't, being built in 54, she doesn't have a lot of the fancy machinery that the new boats have. But she's simple and elegant and strong, and when you tip her and shake her and pour water inside her, it still works pretty well. <laughs> this is the main saloon I just showed, I just showed you. Uh, there's a little galley. Uh, that's the captain's luxurious quarters. Separate cabin there. Aft, and right out that porthole is the cockpit, so I can open that window and talk to the helmsman. There's the head. So this is one head that actually works, and we can keep it clean. And this is her, her drawings from Sparkman Stevens of her sail plan. I, interesting, she's, uh, especially the way she was rigged this way originally, it's the way I use her. She has two small headsails instead of a Genoa, which is the reason we can sail her with two men, uh, because the sails are small enough so one man can do any particular job on the, boat, on the boat. He can reef or take a jib down or put a jib up or what have you. So it, it makes it much easier to sail. And there she is down below. Now they, they don't make drawings like this anymore in sailing yachts. So these are all... This is Sparkman. Well, it came out of the Sparkman Stevens office and which individual actually drew this plan the initials are RBH, and I don't know who that is, but they were craftsmen in themselves. I mean, just the pencil work is incredible. And there she is in Nantucket, as you've seen her. That's an opera house cut a while ago. And here she is, 500 miles east of Great Point, headed for Gibraltar. So there we are out in the ocean. It's, it's interesting, when you're on the ocean, there's no time out there. It's all now. And what happened five minutes ago is like last month. It's hard to remember sometimes. And, you know, when you're going to get off watch an hour from now is like for a kid when he's going to graduate from college. I mean, it's just forever in the future. <laughs> and what's happening right now is very important, like the water dripping down your back or, or this beautiful seascape, whatever it is. And it's also interesting, there's really no there there either. There's no place at sea. You know, this picture could have been taken almost anywhere in any of the oceans of the world. And likewise, if you were here in a different weather conditions, it would look completely different. So it, it's not like you're at Alter Rock or you're at So Too or something like that. You're just at sea. So there we are. And having said all that, the landscape is constantly changing, the seascape, and it's incredibly beautiful. You see, there we are with the moon coming up. In the other direction, the sun is going down. And it's constantly changing, it's like a light show.
first when the sun goes down. Full moon comes up. And if possible, it's even more glorious at night. <laughs> you see there, the, that's, that's the moonlight. Those clouds are lit by the moonlight. This is just taken a few, a little while later. And you can see the red spot on the staunch and there. Yeah, that's from the glow of the compass. Yeah, can the lights be turned down? These, these pictures would show much better if we didn't have so much overhead light. That may be too complicated. <laughs> there you can see the compass shining up the cockpit. That's When we're sailing along, the only ar artificial light comes from the compass. We have running lights, but you can't see them from, from inside the boat. <laughs> so the question is, what do we do when we're out at sea? And I guess the first thing we do is we eat. <laughs> and we had, we had several cooks aboard. We, uh, in fact, I think we went right around in, in rotation. Uh, and then some people start showing off and they'll hog it for a couple of days, and it, which none of us mind. Uh, so there's a little bit of showing off going on here, who can present the finest lunch. And, and we also see Al, uh, Connor's a photographer. He took a lot of these pictures. And Russell is a cinematographer. So there's also a photographic competition going on. We're, 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 we leave Nantucket with an ice chest full of ice, and that's going to last about 16 or 17 days. And of course, one of the things we figured, we started late, we're 12 days late, we've got to get to eventually Gibraltar and then to Rome and back to Nantucket before the grandchildren get here. So we're, we're on a time schedule. Uh, but, you know, we're fine because we're going to be in the westerlies and we're just going to fly over to the Azores. You know, we'll never have to beat the wind or anything. So we figure we'll have plenty of time to stop and get more ice and stuff like that. We prepare, of course, that maybe the ice will run out and then the food will get a little less glammy. But we're making hay while the sun shines, so to speak. There's Oliver making pizza. There's some Paula pizza. <laughs> there we are eating it. Get the jacket for that better. So we do a lot of eating, and then, of course, we have to keep things clean. That's cleaning up the dishes. <laughs> and cleaning includes our laundry. And so at times this boat looks a little bit like an oaky boat. Sometimes if it's at all windy or raining, you know, you can't put the laundry outside, so it goes up in the forepeak. <laughs> With 300 gallons, which is a lot. Uh, so that's really not a problem with a with a serious crew. Now, if when we're cruising with couples aboard, you know, we can go through that in a day or two. <laughs> this actually sailing across the Atlantic is is not the hardest time for water. I used to take the boat down to the uh, Bahamas in the summer, and we'd leave Bermuda and sail, you know, eight, nine hundred miles to the Bahamas and then start cruising. And we'd be in the odd islands and there are no docks. So there's no place to pick up water. So I might have six or seven people aboard, including a bunch of teenagers, for 30 days, maybe even 35 days. I remember one time we came, and I, I tell the kids, I said, you know, they said, can we, can we wash 
in fresh water? And I say, sure, but you'll have to drink salt. <laughs> and so they took that to heart. And we, we came into uh, Georgetown at Zuma, which has got a proper dock and a hose, so they charge you 20 cents a gallon for water and meter it. And we filled up. We used 67 gallons in five weeks. So, so 300 gallons is plenty of water. So we also navigate. We try to figure out where we are. And the boys are interested in the old celestial navigation. This is my Navy sextant that I got for my 17th birthday. I used to sell these Army surplus in yachting magazines. They did it for about 15, 20 years until they ran out, I guess, and that was the end of that. Uh, so I used this for 38 years until we finally got GPS on Impala in 1997, which is there. That little red line is around the GPS box. You, you all are familiar with this. This will do 20 or maybe even 200 lines of position a second, uh, and it will cross them, and you get an act to pick. You know where you are within 10 feet. Why? Using a sextant, we can get a line of position in about four minutes. And if we take two of them three or four hours apart, we'll know more or less where we are within about two miles. So, which is good enough, but the GPS has really made, it's made this wonderful old machine obsolete. But the boys want to learn how to use it because that's what their heroes used. And so they want to know how their heroes did it. You see, there they are. They've got a, the almanac on the right, the site form, the site reduction table. And this is the uh, actual chart that we used to uh, navigate on as we went across. I, I had to enhance the track because it's done in pencil and it's so dim you can't see it. But the, uh, the dots don't necessarily represent daily positions. They're just fixes. They're, all, they're more or less day by day, but not exactly. And you can see this swinging south out of Nantucket, and then we got more or less to the latitude of the Azores and turned due east, figuring that we we're going to make really good time with these westerlies. You can see that we're, we're actually on a beam reach there, which is that was really good for us. So part of navigating is staying out of the way. And uh, so we keep a good lookout for these ships, and which there aren't very many out there. But the ones that are there are really big, and they're really going fast. And that's sort of a more comfortable position when they're going away from you. So we also fix things when we're at sea. This is a t typical. This is the main hatch. It's, you know, I've been working on this, trying to get rid of the leaks for about 25 years at this point. And I had, every, had everything all worked out. There's a good gasket around it. We've got to lock it down tight. And the year before, I'd taken it up to the boatyard for some refurbishment, and they replaced the glazing in it. And the glazing was like an inch thick. It's a big, it's a big hatch. It's like three feet square. These guys figured, look, let's put a beam across the middle, and we can use much thinner glazing. It's lighter, it's cheaper, blah, blah, blah. So I said, fine. But the trouble is the beam interfered with the gasket. So when we left Nantucket that morning, we had a nice trickle of water coming in from two points all over the main saloon table and the so on and so forth. So they said, later, the, we were going to fix that. And uh, so we're constantly fixing things. Uh, you can see we got the bucket out there to flash test the fix. And you can see the wood chips on the deck haven't been cleaned up yet. And that's always another great fun. And there's Phil. He's a master mechanic, so he's sharpening some of our tools. He likes to, he just likes fooling around with machinery and things that are broken. And we didn't have really enough to keep him busy, but. Anyway, that's, that's what he does. And here, we, this is typical. We've got 
our four instruments that do the wind and the boat speed and the depth and so forth, they're notoriously temperamental. And you have a really good summer, you call it a four instrument summer. That meant all four of them worked all summer long. <laughs> and that's noteworthy. So anyway, the one of them is getting all fogged up. So we drilled a hole in the glass and created a a natural ventilation system to blow the fog out of the thing so we can see what it's reading. It worked pretty well. And meanwhile, Russell rigged his camera to the main sheet. You see he's a photographer, not a sailor. And uh, he's taking our picture. Oliver's going to try this thing out and take some pictures of us too. So we also keep an eye out for things. We find things out in the middle of the ocean. You see the, right there is an abandoned fishing place. It's interesting, though, the water is very clean compared to what it was when I first did this in 1978. You see very little trash in the water. Uh, and what you do see tends to be you know, industrial debris like this fishing float that got loose from somebody. So we went over and we picked it up to see, make sure we knew what it was. You can see what a beautiful day it is over there. We had a couple of weeks of this thing over there. Show off our prizes. And send it back into the deep. hit that by mistake, but anyway. We also find fi fish, or fish find us. And the dolphins are, as you all know, are just spectacular. No difference on this trip. You see, it looks like they're in air, it's just that we're in this Gulf Stream water and you can see down about 40 or 50 feet like it's, it's glass. We're about a thousand miles from Nantucket. We're halfway between Nantucket and Flores. And we're also about a thousand miles from Cape Carwell, uh, Greenland. So we're, we're a long way from shore. And you can see we're barefoot and in shorts. And it's tropical. And, and no matter how many times you've seen this, you still want to go forward and have a look because it's, it's just exciting. There they are again. Mr. Russell's going to take a movie of it. Now you can count them there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine in that photograph. That's just, a, that's just on one side of the boat. We didn't see any whales. So we, we have on other trips. We had one famous whale that came right up alongside the boat. It was the size of Impala. Uh, and it came, I could have touched it with the boat hook. I mean, it was that close, like the Yacht Club launch close. And it's when we had Nat Philbrick on board, his first time offshore, and I think the whale came to check him out. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this guy that's been writing all these books? <laughs> so we not only the fish find us, but we tried to go fishing with very, you know, Modest success, a certain amount of disaster. Uh, yeah, they get the whole boat involved in trying to straighten this fish light up. And I think our, you know, every time before I go, I'm not a fisherman really myself, but every time I go, we've, we've always got people who are really interested in fishing. I'm always saying, you go find out, get the right gear, get the right tackle. Find out from these guys what we need. Let's catch some fish. And they all, you know, they go to Bill Fisher. They go to Tom Molesco. They go, you know, they go to the experts. And we go out there with all this stuff. We never catch a fish. <laughs> and I think the deal is, I think the fish offshore have different habits than the fish onshore. And I took Steve Marcoux once to the West Indies. And 
it looked like the same stuff to me, but he caught a fish every day, sometimes two or three. So it can be done. I think we caught one tuna fish which got away, so I'm not sure that counts. And they landed a, like a two-foot shark as food. Two lines, 3,500 miles. That's 7,000 fish hook miles. That's what we got out of it. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's, that's, this is what we do. Yeah, the boys are doing arts and crafts. They're tying Turk's heads around their legs. And Russell's writing in his diary. And of course, all this time, we're sailing, steering a boat, telling sea stories. You know, we, we have an autopilot, but we never use it. But it's really fun to sail, and people look forward to an hour, two hours, three hours on the helm. It's a pleasure. You know, Bill's got a lot of hair. <laughs> but sometimes he, he wears, he wears instead of a, he's, here he's got his wool watch cap on, I guess you call that. But sometimes he wears a neck warmer and just pulls it up. And so he looks like Bart Simpson. That, that will come back into the story. <laughs> and there are a lot of different places to view the sea from. And it's really good sailing. We're making good time now. And we're approaching the Azores. Wind's blowing a little harder. We've, we've had mostly light air, but we had a couple of days where it blew up to 4 to 6, which is 25 to 30. And then we take the Yankee down, maybe put a reef in the main. Not, not as windy as when we left Nantucket. But uh, you know, it's reaching, so we're really moving along. It's good sailing. <laughs> They're dressed in their foul weather gear because it gets a little wet on land. There's Bill and his neck warmer. <laughs> You see, you see the mizzen there strapped in. We're still hard, hard on the wind or close reaching. Where are those westerlies? <laughs> and there we see land. You see the island there in front of us is uh, Flores, which is the westernmost Azorean island. Uh, Azor is where a lot of the people from Nantucket are from originally. And Flores is so named because uh, they. It's agricultural, basically, I and mean, they do whaling, but you know the rest of the people are farmers. And they segregate the fields with hedgerows of hydrangeas. So it's pretty spectacular. And there's a map of them. See, we're we're up here. We're just coming into Flores. It's got its companion island Corvo, and then we're going to go on between Fayal and Pico, and then come out towards Gibraltar. Here we are coming in close. The, the wind's blowing pretty hard out of the northeast, so we're getting in behind the uh, island in the smooth water. This is the first time we haven't been at sea for a little over two weeks. Uh, and you, you can see the water getting frothy there near the boat. In fact, towards the land, it's sort of slick because it's in the lee. The islands are high. They're vol volcanoes sticking up out of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And as looking back where we came from, you can see the winds blowing. And in the distance there is Corvo, which is a small circular volcano. Uh, Flores is a little more complicated. I think it's two or three volcanoes. It's a little more complicated shape. And there are these little villages tucked in behind the hills. It's dry now, but you can see the lines running off those hills. In the rainy season, those are waterfalls. The first time we came in here in 1978, it was on a rainy day. And every 100 yards, there'd be a waterfall falling off these plateau into the sea. It's spectacular. And of course, it was a different time of year, so 
the hydrangeas and things. We're coming up around the southeast point. Now, we're really behind schedule now because we've been beating to windward instead of rushing over here. I think we're 17 days out, and I was hoping I'd catch up a few days and uh, stop. Flores doesn't really have a harbor, but you can heave to and send a boat into the little uh, village. Uh, it's a beautiful place. I've done it a couple of times, but we have to sail on by and back there behind Oliver's head now. We're headed for Porta, in, uh, which is the big yachting port in the Azores. This is right in the center of the Atlantic, so anybody going from the Caribbean to Europe or from the Mediterranean to the Mediterranean or from America to the Med, they all stop in Horta and get ice like we ought to and uh, get cleaned up and so on and so forth. And there it is. Uh, we're coming, if you remember the chart, we're coming in between uh, Fayal, the island of Fayal, and Kiko. Kiko is a very high volcano, uh, so it's the there. I think it sits up seven or eight or 9,000 feet out of the water and about 25,000 feet off the ocean bottom. Uh, so the, because of the two islands, there's a proper harbor in, in Fayal called Horta. Uh, it's probably the only place in the Azores where you can really get away from ocean conditions. And all the other ports are purely man-made with giant seawalls and things. But unfortunately... We have to just sail by. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know we're, we've, we've, got, we've got a calendar. We've got dates. We've got places we've got to go. Uh, you know, and yeah, I mean, the girls are back there behind Bill waving to us from the beach. <laughs> and so odd we go. This is some of the, the volcanic rocks that are out in front of Kiko's Harbor. Uh, it's called Magellana. We sail right down the north shore of Kiko. You know, we're 200 yards offshore. And they're all... I don't know, this isn't showing... Well, in the next one, you'll see it. This is... You can see the side of the volcano there. And it's funny, the, the clouds just seem to come right off the land. I think it's a... You get to a certain elevation, and it's, it's really fog. It's not a cloud. It turns into a cloud further on. And you can see it's, that's just volcanic rock cinder broken up by the, the wave action. And the shore just comes straight up out of the ocean. Churches everywhere. Beautiful architecture. These islands are quite isolated. Uh, Flores, when I first went there, had an airplane once a week and a and a uh, boat once every two or three weeks. And now I think they get a couple of boats a week. And I don't know if they have any uh, regular air service. So goodbye to Florida, I guess. So Bill decides to cut his hair. <laughs> you make something, make lemonade out of lemons here. And we're on, we're on our way. We've, you, can, you can see some land, I think, in the background there. We're in amongst these islands. We can see land for about another 12 hours. But we're basically headed out to sea again and across uh, to Europe. And we're now, once again, we're out of the, properly out of the westerlies. And this is where they stopped. We had all those non-westerlies for three weeks. And now we're in the Portuguese trade. So between the Azores and the Portuguese mainland, the wind and the current blows out of the north predominantly. It's part of the big circular system in the North Atlantic. And so the water gets quite a bit colder. It's not cold like Nantucket in May, but it's cold, colder than the Gulf Stream. And the wind tends to blow out of the north. It's called the Portuguese trade. And that's good for us because we can be close reaching and close hauled and make good progress. And it's glorious sailing. Conditions are a little bit more wintry. You know, we've got our 
warm suits on and hat. And you see the decks are wet from the spray. And we feel close hauled. I think we're, we're about six days between the Azores and Portugal, which is sort of in the middle here. And there we, whoops, come back here. Where did the pixel? That's Point Sagres. That's the southwest tip of Europe. Uh, it's a double cape, but the southern piece of it is uh, Point Sagres. And you see the white buildings on the end there. It's, it's just a vertical cliff about 250 feet high. And the white buildings on the end are Prince Henry the Navigator's school that he created in, what, 1480, something like that? No, before that, 1450, 1440. And this was to train navigators and collect uh, written material and technology to try to get around Africa to India. And uh, it ended up with, I guess, Diaz's voyage. Uh, and indirectly, Columbus, because Columbus knew all these guys and hung out here ended up uh, sailing for the Queen of Spain, who was a rival. But, you know, this is like, if she's Harvard, this is Yale. <laughs> <coughs> it's really quite spectacular. It's, it's interesting, too. It's, it's fortified, of course, because they didn't want any nasty guys to come take all their high tech. But because of its location on this point, the fort, the walls are only on one side. And they go from one seacoast to the other, and then the school itself is all out on the point behind the walls. And so to get at from the sea, you'd have to climb up two or 300 feet of vertical cliff. So we're approaching the end here, and we're sailing into the Gulf of Cadiz. Uh, this is Gibraltar. And right about where the red line comes on the map here from the west, the wind, of course, turns east. And so you can see we're not headed for Gibraltar. We're beating to windward. Uh, and the wind comes east and it starts to pick up. And as we get closer in, the line gets quite jig-jaggy uh, because those pink lines are the uh, shipping lanes. And this is, it's, it's like Interstate 95 here. These will be big ships and they'll be maybe a mile apart. You know, they, they go a mile in three or four minutes. So they're, they're just in a line three or four minutes apart. And they're two lanes, so there can be as many as four ships abreast, you know, one going east, one going west, either going to Europe or going south to the Panama Canal. And so uh, we're beating to windward, coming into shallow water, currents running out of the Mediterranean about two and a half to three knots, and we're trying to stay out of the shipping lanes because that, in effect, is like a fence. We crossed it once, but it was so complicated crossing it. We thought, you know, we lose more land than we do short tacking. And it's flowing. Beg pardon? No, we're, we're beating to windward now against four, six to seven. It's going 30, 35 again. Yeah, the engine doesn't do any good then. We, Impala's got a nice little engine that's good for docking, and it's good in calm, but you know, all, all it would do in those conditions would make us bump into the waves a little harder and make it a lot wetter, and probably slow us down, if anything. And so we're punching the waves out of the side, and we're keeping an eye out on the shipping. But we're getting there, and up ahead, that's a piece of Africa. That's the African coast. I think that's Abel Musa, I think they call it. That's the south pillar of the Pillar of Hercules. <laughs> there it is, closer up with a typical ship in front of it. And, you know, just off the screen would be another one in front of it. So, you, you know, if you time it just right, you can sail between them. But <laughs> it's... 
You know, they don't stop like the cars do for the ducks. <laughs> That's the other side in uh, Spain. The mountains aren't quite as dramatic in Spain. And they've covered the, of course, you know, what people will do to mountains is awful. They've, on the Spanish side, they've covered the mountains up with windmills. And I like to put them right, of course, right on top so they get the most wind. And uh, it was a lot prettier when I went through in 78. It reminded me a little bit of uh, coal mining in West Virginia where they cut the tips off the mountains, you know. You know, a scar anywhere else wouldn't be so noticeable, but they have to go right at the top of the mountain. And we're coming to the end. We get to Tarifa, which is the last little bump there uh, before you go into the Mediterranean. And the wind dies down and the tide turns. So all of a sudden we go, we've been beating up to it for really a day and a half, 36 hours. And once we get there, we go by so fast it's hard to even see it. <laughs> it's all gone in 15 minutes. And there's the Rock of Gibraltar, which is just inside the strait. So this is a, you know, we've got the, the pillars of Hercules are behind us, right at our back. So there's Gibraltar. And Oliver's glad to see us. There it is up close, the lighthouse of Point Europa. Right about now, right behind us comes the uh, United States of America, the aircraft carrier. And of course, we've been hearing them on the radio because if traffic control wants to know who they are, and they say we're the aircraft carrier America, and they say where you're going, where are you going? Because that's what they ask all the ships. And you know, they've got this 18-year-old on the radio, and he says, "Well, I'm not really authorized to tell you that." <laughs> <laughs> So I, I think they just like talking to each other. So this goes back and forth several times. No, no change in the communication. But uh, they sent a helicopter out to check out the Impalas. We were excited and we waved them. We didn't have our ensign up because we'd been at sea. But we thought about that five minutes too late. And there we come into uh, Gibraltar, the city of Gibraltar, the town of Gibraltar. And there we are. And you can see in the background, Gibraltar's a little bit tawdry. It's a place that's dying. It's not important anymore. Except for, to a certain extent, as a tax haven. And even as a tax haven, you just, your accountant has to live there when you're done. But we're really glad to be there. And there we are in the marina. <clears throat> we got our picture taken. And there's Connor. He knows what to do when you get in after 26 <laughs> days. <laughs> And we're in a European town. You know, we left Nantucket. We didn't get on an airplane or anything. We just left Nantucket on this boat that we all know, and we sit around and steer it for 26 days, and all of a sudden now we're in Europe. It's, re it's really an amazing experience. And we found the Gibraltar Yacht Club. <laughs> but look at that. Like everything else in Gibraltar, it's on the downside. They've sold their waterfront which somebody has filled in and built high-rise condominiums on. But and there's Gibraltar from the top. You're looking out towards the Straits and Pillar of Hercules. And, uh, actually, you're probably looking back sort of towards Spain. I think that's the airport sticking out there in the water. So you're looking northwest there. And that's that. From Gibraltar, we sail on we went to Barcelona and finally ended up in Rome. And now we're in the, new, the old world, the, which is new to us. So. You, you, you all ask good questions while I was talking, but do you have any other questions you'd like to comment? Yeah, Certainly. Yeah, we actually, we actually used, you saw a couple of those days, like when we first got out, uh, that's sort of the first picture in the sunshine. We were under power. So we, we used, I think, 40 gallons of diesel, which 
you know, 26 days, two of them were under power. And we almost, I find, we almost never have to charge, we now almost never have to run the engine just to charge the battery. Uh, we get becalmed often enough that that keeps the battery charged. I do now. And that's, I use that mostly for when the boat's in the boatyard. Like right now, it's sitting in Greece in a marina. And that solar charger's keeping the battery tipped up, which is good for them. So we don't really use it for power, but it, it's good for battery maintenance. No flying fish. And, uh, you know, we were in the trade winds, really. <laughs> I don't know why not. But I, I don't think. You know, you don't get flying fish so much in the Gulf Stream. Uh, it's on the other side. And we were, I didn't talk much about the Gulf Stream, but we got in it there at the beginning. And then very quickly, we're, it dissipates into the North Atlantic Drift. And it's much less organized. And we were in places where the current was going south, and then 20 miles later, it'd be going north. Sometimes we'd have a counter current. Often the general average of it all is about one knot towards Europe. So it's a good thing to be in, but it's not organized. And we tended to be on the north side of that. So uh, I don't remember any flying fish. We get them on the way back to Nantucket when we go to the southern region. Hi, Alf. Yeah. Um, could you tell us, th this trip seemed pretty smooth sailing, but um, just for entertainment purposes, could you tell us about like the hairiest situation you encountered? and all your sailing? Well, I guess the most important thing is, is the Impala is a really lucky boat. So no matter how hairy a situation we get in, she saves it. Either the wind goes down or we get off the rock or whatever. But most, oh, people are interested in, in wind. And, uh, you know, like when we left Nantucket, we were, that was a moderate gale. And really when we got to Gibraltar, we were sailing into a moderate gale. Uh, those kinds of conditions, if you sail all summer, you're going to get those. You, you get that once a month if you, if you don't stay in port, you're not port bound. Uh, what we very rarely get was when the wind picks up another 10 or 15 knots and you get a storm. And I think Impala's only been in one of those maybe in 25 years. So you get a storm every four or five years really, unless you have a lucky boat. Uh, <laughs> And then, of course, the ones you read about are the hurricane-type situations like the Peking was in uh, that washed, I think, 57 commercial ships up on the Dutch shore that, that day. And those are getting in one of those is like being in an airplane crash. I mean, it just fortunately doesn't happen very often. And when it does happen, you, you know, each one is different. From this trip, the boat is still in Europe. And uh, I, I don't know when she's coming home. But she, she's been to Europe before. So she came home once. <laughs> it's wonderful sailing out of this harbor, but the most wonderful thing of all is sailing back into it from afar. We didn't have very much, and it's getting difficult, ironically, because of the high tech. If you don't have a satellite navigator, or well, not navigator, but you know, communicator, uh, it's hard to get weather because they're not doing it so much on radio anymore because it's obsolete. It's not commercially viable. Uh, they still give they they give a offshore forecast, which takes you out about. 700 miles from America. And they used to give a high seas forecast, but they either don't do it or they only do it once a day. And you can get it off WWV if you know how to do it, but it's very abbreviated and very sketchy. And so we either didn't do it, or I have an Iridium telephone, and if we needed to know what was going on, I would give my daughter Chloe a call here on Nantucket, and she knows how to use a computer and she would look up the weather where we were and tell us. Uh, and that, and so when you, you know, it's complicated to get it, but if you need to know it, uh, 
that's how I do it. I did it with Iridium. And probably 10 years from now, everybody will have internet on board and you just ask them. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Enjoy.